Good morning. Please stand and worship with us. Who breaks the power of sin and darkness? Whose love is mighty and so much stronger? The King of glory, the King above all kings. Who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder and leaves us breathless in awe and wonder? The King of glory, the King above all kings. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. You lay down your life. That I would be set free. Oh, Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. Who brings our chaos back into order? Who makes the orphan? A son and daughter, the King of glory, the King of glory, who rules the nation with truth and justice, shine like the sun in all of its brilliance, the King of glory, the King above all kings. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love That you would take my place That you would bear my cross You lay down your life That I would be set free Oh, Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me worthy is the lamb who was slain worthy is the king who conquered the grave worthy is the lamb who was slain worthy is the king who conquered the grave worthy is the lamb who was slain Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy, worthy, worthy. Oh, this is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. You lay down your life That I would be set free Oh, Jesus, I sing for All that you've done for me Good morning and welcome Welcome to those joining us in the auditorium, and also welcome to those who are joining on the live stream. Uh, we're so glad uh, to be gathered together and worshiping God after a few days of adventurous weather. It's so glad, it's so good to be worshiping uh, the Lord this morning. Uh, before we're continuing on uh, and continuing our worship, we're going to read a few verses from Psalms 111. They read, Praise the Lord. I will thank the Lord with all my heart as I meet with his godly people. How amazing are the deeds of the Lord! All who delight in him should ponder them. 
Everything he does reveals his glory and majesty. His righteousness never fails. He causes us to remember his wonderful works. How gracious and merciful is our Lord. Join us as we continue worshiping. Marvelous grace of our loving Lord, grace that exceeds our sin and our guilt. Yonder on Calvary's mount outpoured, there where the blood of the Lamb was slain. Despair like the sea waves roll, threaten the soul with infinite loss. Grace that is greater, yes, grace untold, points to the refuge, the mighty cross. Grace, grace, God. Grace that will pardon and cleanse within grace, grace, God's grace, grace that is greater than all our sin. Dark is the stain that we cannot hide. What can avail to wash it away? Look, there is flowing a crimson tide. Whiter than snow you may be today. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that Where 
where there is darkness let me shine light and may your love cause us to open up cause us to open up our hearts may your light cause us to shine so God, thank you for this morning. Thank you for this time to come together and worship you this morning. I pray that you'd give us the time to focus on you, give us the focus to hear from you and the ears to listen. I pray uh, that we'd be open to you and for what you have to say to us this morning. Thank you just for this time to worship you. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Sometimes it's tough being my own tech crew this morning. Good morning. Uh, thanks for being here this morning. Uh, welcome live stream folks. Evidently quite a few of you this morning. Uh, fun weather. Uh, winter time in Michigan. Kind of cool. Um, Communion is going to be first today. So if you have your elements, go ahead and take those up if you would please. And then uh, I'll explain more about what we're doing today. 
I think there's a lady that needs some. There you go. Anybody else? There you go. Um, hope for the hopeless. We just sang how important that is for us. We live in a culture that desperately needs hope. And this is a reminder every week of the hope that we have in Christ, of the confidence we have in what he's done for us, in us, through us, to us. And so we celebrate that hope this morning. We celebrate that first by remembering the body of Christ that was broken, that was hung on the cross uh, because of my sin, your sin, our sin. And then we share in the grape, the juice, the vine, the reminder of the new covenant that we have through Christ's blood. Oh, we have a guest speaker today. He doesn't know he's a guest speaker because he's on video. And uh, if we flew him in from Atlanta, it would be really expensive. So uh, we're not doing that today. Uh, but we'll talk about that in just a minute. Uh, anybody knows it snowed this week? A couple of us noticed that. Um, if you get our text messages, so if you haven't signed up for that yet, you can go online, you can do that, or you can, there's probably a number they can text and they can do that kind of thing. Um, then we'll let you know Sunday mornings, we usually de determine whether we're going to have in person uh, based on how, uh, if our furthest people out can make it. So Phil Smith was in the sound booth today. He drove here from Ada. I went out there yesterday. They live halfway into the UP. I didn't know Ada was that far into the Upper Peninsula, but it, it felt like it yesterday. If he goes, hey, there's zero way I can get there, those kinds of things affect whether we can do in-person worship or not. But we'll know that early enough to send a text message out uh, before 9 o'clock so that you'll know that that's true. Those online, you can do that. Um, we'll put it on the Facebook post. We sometimes can get it onto Wood TV, uh, Channel 8, for those of you that still have an antenna kind of a deal. So if it's snowy, that's where you can go. Uh, news letters out at the welcome desk, and you're welcome to pick up one of those if you haven't already. Um, we're in a series uh, called uh, Twisted Truth. And uh, in preparation for that, I use a variety of resources. One of those is uh, a, a series of some stuff that Andy Stanley did a few years ago. Andy Stanley's a senior pastor at North Point Church down in Atlanta, um, one of the mega churches of mega churches in America, and, uh, and full of a variety of age groups. And as a part of that, we got to this section here where we need to talk about S-E-X. And so there's this part that we need to talk about because the culture that we live in has twisted the truth about sex. And so uh, in preparing, I went, man, Andy did such a great job with this. Why don't we have Andy come and do it? And um, he, of course, is too busy to come and do it. And so we're going to use a video of his. Let me explain some background there. Um, many of you know that a couple of weeks ago I was in Tampa uh, for the Red Cross as a volunteer helping out after the hurricane se uh, season there. And I stayed in a hotel in Tampa, but I drove down to the Fort Myers area every day because that's where the real problems were. And I visited the shelters that were there doing spiritual care. Um, and so one, uh, the second week I was there, the second weekend, um, I drove back on Sat Friday night, Saturday, Saturday night, I guess it was, and pulled into the hotel uh, parking lot. And the parking that was jam-packed with cars, which was unusual. And then as I finally found a parking spot quite a ways away and walked over, realized that the hotel ballroom meeting rooms were the site of that year's uh, senior prom or prom, uh, homecoming uh, for the high school that was right across the street from the hotel. And as I was walking up and all these kids are there and they're excited and they're having fun, it looked like the Academy Awards ceremony with the young girls and the young guys were dressed. 
that makes sense to you? And, and, and I know that the young ladies spent tons of money on their dresses and on their makeup and all that kind of stuff. And as an over 60-year-old uh, guy, I am not supposed to notice those kinds of things. And so as I'm walking up to the, and their kids are there and they're talking and they're laughing, I am trying hard to either just look at the ground or look at their eyes, not noticing much of anything else. But you can see tons of color. You can see tons of other stuff there. And it reminded me of when I was 16, 17, 18, and I went to homecoming and prom with the girls that I took to those events. And I remember the hormone levels of 16, 17, and 18-year-old boys at that stage of life. And I'm thinking, boy, I hope there are a lot of parental lectures before this event took place. A lot of parents going, okay, you will be home at 917 tonight. You will not. There is no, we are not doing anything other than that. When I was in high school, I had some friends who didn't do homecoming and prom because of that. At that age, before I was a Christian, I understood it, but I didn't quite get it. I just knew that I needed to be good. Good guys, good gals, there's certain things that they don't do because that's the good thing. Then I became a Christian and realized it wasn't just about being good, it was about being godly. And that's a different motivation for why we treat one another the way we do. In our hallway this last week, our uh, Nate put up uh, some, uh, some things up in the hallway uh, for how we kind of, what, what's parenting? We're raising our kids. What are the things we do? One of those is sexual integrity, and it's, you can't read the bottom part very well, but you can certainly go out there and read that any time. Um, little kids, we introduce them to their body. Uh, the next stage, we inform them about how things work. Then we interpret what the, what's changing about their bodies when they're you know, 11, 12, 13. And then we coach them toward healthy relationships. Parents need tools to help you coach your kids. As a new believer, I remember reading Matthew 5, 27. You have heard the commandment that says you must not commit adultery, Jesus says. But I say anyone who even looks at a woman with do you know what that last, next word is? Even anyone looks at a woman with lust. And the women all knew that one. The guys were the ones who were supposed to. Has already committed adultery with her in his heart. One of my uh, roommates in college repeated 2 Timothy 2.22 on a daily basis, flee youthful lust. I think he knew around a bunch of college students that was an important verse to remember. And I have. The fact is that lust sells. And our culture uses it all the time. I did 20-some years of campus ministry, seven years of that. I had to do high school weeks of camp as a part of that. Um, I've done four decades of life in ministry. I have had the sex talk uh, 30 or 40 different times in front of groups of people. And I... Don't enjoy it, but I do it because it's the right thing to do. Uh, with the college students, I started it off this way. On our wedding night, neither my wife nor I knew what we were doing. But after six kids, we have proof that we figured it out. <laughs> so you don't need a lot of practice beforehand. You can wait. We were a couple for three and a half years before we got married. In our current culture, that's pretty rare. For most of you in this room right now, that wasn't rare in your era. But it's getting rarer as we go along. The goal isn't to be good, it's to be godly. Andy, when he spoke this, was in a room full of a thousand, several thousand people, all age groups, mainly geared towards singles and high schoolers. But I think as adults, as folks with high schoolers and singles in our family, this is a valuable message for us. I'll come up in about a half an hour or so and wrap up, and then we'll sing another song. Go ahead. Please.
I spent uh, 15 years or so talking to high school students. That's how I kind of got my start in ministry. So I talked about sex a lot. Um, I, I talked about as much as I, I possibly could. Um, one of my favorite things to do, I, I should do this sometime, is I, I, I created a lecture on, that was for premarital sex, and I would come in as a different character, and I'd wear like a, a lab coat, and my name was Dr. Les, L-E-S, do it, D-O-I-T, Dr. Les, do it, and I would come in and lecture to high school kids about why they should go out and have as much premarital sex as possible, and I was very convincing. It was scary. I could just see the adults going, oh my God. I never thought of that. And kids are going, well, yeah. Fine. You know, I had one kid raise his hand. We did a question and answer. And he said, you're the first person I ever heard explain this the way I've been thinking about it. You know, and, and you know, then I'd come back, hopefully, and, and correct all the error I had created. It was fun. And, and one of my favorite things would be to do this at a camp where I had, like, multiple nights where I was going to speak. So I'd come in one night and just do the Dr. Let's Do It thing and give these great arguments and statistics and illustrations about why you should have sex outside of marriage. I mean, you wouldn't buy a pair of shoes without trying them on first. You know, stuff like that. You know, real meaty stuff and and then I would wait and come back the next y'all seem a little bit nervous <laughs> a little nervous in here today and, and then I would come back the next night so I'd leave them hanging a whole day and it just used to drive the adults crazy they go look you just you can't just let it lay there for a whole day they're gonna they're gonna think that premarital sex is okay I'm like they already think that that's why we're having the can anyway so anyway i i got just really comfortable and be too comfortable talking about this and and here, here's the deal after many 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 years of that and, and now i'm an adult pastor with adults and i've heard all kinds of stories and dealt with i mean just every imaginable situation here i am you know all these years later i'm 48 and i'm absolutely convinced that what the bible has to say about sex is not only true and it's not only relevant, but beyond that, it's kind of common sense. It's just sort of good advice. That even if you don't believe the Bible is inspired, as we're going to see today, there is something the Scripture says. In fact, there's an insight we're going to look at today that, you know, modern psychiatrists and psychologists have their own terminology for. But it was back here, you know, way, you know, 2,000 years ago. It, it, it's so incredibly relevant that... Isn't as old-fashioned as it sounds sometimes. I just think it's still worth talking about. But here, here, here's sort of the, the pushback. Every time I talk about this, whether it's high school students or adults or, or singles or whatever, I feel a little bit like an Old Testament prophet who's sort of <laughs> crying in the wilderness, you know, don't do it. And everybody's going, ah, get him out of here. You know, put him back in the well. Or, you know, who, where are you from, Rip? Have you been asleep for 200 years? I mean, nobody, nobody thinks that way anymore. And, and I feel like it's almost a total waste of time. I, I don't think for a minute that after this message, and I'll be as compassionate, I mean, as passionate as I can be. Actually, I won't be very compassionate, just passionate. And I'll give you my scripture, and I'll argue, and be loud. And, you know, and, and then most of us are just going to walk out the door back into our culture and go, that was interesting. What would you expect from the preacher? And just kind of go back into this world that just totally thinks that what the scripture says about this subject is impractical and irrelevant. But I'm going to tell you, I think in your heart and the heart of most people, except for the most callous of individuals, there's something that rings true about this for all of us, as impractical as it is. And so every once in a while, I feel like I got to get up like the prophet and go, okay, let's say it one more time. Here's what the Bible says about about sex, maybe the, 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 the defining moment for me um, as I transitioned from working with high school students into working with adults was a conversation I had with a lady, and I've shared this before, I believe, but I'll say it again. I had done a presentation for a bunch, about several hundred high school kids on, on this subject, and there was a lady who had just become a Christian and just started coming to our church. It wasn't this church, another church. And um, so sometimes adults would come and stand in the back of our high school ministry stuff because it was fun and loud. And she was, had been married. She was in her early 30s, very much into the whole singles thing and very you know, attractive and just you know, sort of you know, in, in that world. But just become a Christian, just started coming to church. And so not the night I did the presentation, but after that, she tracked me down and she said, Andy, Andy, I got to ask you a quick question. I said, yeah. And she said, it's about this sex thing. And of course, that's just a weird way to start a conversation about this sex thing. She said, now, this is what she said, and she was as sincere as she could be. She said, now that, that what you said the other night, that's for teenagers, right? <laughs> she was just asking. I said, excuse me? She said, you know, that whole no sex till you're married, that, 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 that's for teenagers, right? And, you know, went on to say, you know, she'd been married, she's dating, she's kind of out in the world, and surely what I said about no sex, that didn't apply to people in her stage of life, did it? She's asking, sincere. And, and this is one of those moments I have as a pastor so many times because people will stop me and ask, you know, Andy, how did they build the space shuttle? Yeah, 15 seconds. You know, it's like, okay, 
That's, that's an important question and they actually built one and it actually flies, but I can't answer that. I don't, that's not a sound bite question. So I, as I do it so often, I'm going, God, I need a sound bite. I, I can't give her 20 minutes or, you know, I need a sound bite. How do, how? And, and so this question came out of my mouth that I've repeated many times since then. I said, let me ask you a question. I said, has sex outside of marriage made your life better or just more complicated? And she almost immediately teared up. She said, more complicated. I said, that's why it's not just for teenagers. It's for everybody. Now, you know what's weird about this subject? <laughs> You're going, yeah, there's a lot weird about it. Um, th this is what's so weird about this subject. Is it's almost stupid to have to talk about it. Because if we would just kind of pause for a minute, and, and let's, don't even bring the Bible into it, let's just kind of be American citizens for a moment and look at our culture. And if we would all just kind of get together and ask the question, is it working? Are we better off? Are we happier? Are the children healthy and wholesome? Are more people staying together? Are marriages lasting longer? Is it help the economy? The, the, see, you don't need the preacher to tell you that it just makes your life and your family and your soul and your brain and your relationships more complicated. When you take this incredible gift of sex and you rip it out of the context God designed it for, and I'll get to that in just a second, when you just kind of put it out there and it becomes random and it's kind of go with your feelings and kids will be kids and boys will be boys and who cares what I look at because I'm not hurting anybody else. What we know, you don't need me to tell you this, is it's not making your life better. It's not, is it? And, and I don't even know you, and I know it's not. That guys, you know, you just wish like crazy you could just kind of turn off part of your psyche and part of your soul when you walk down the, the concourse in the airport or when you travel. You just wish there's a part of you you could leave at home so it would stay right within the context of your marriage because when you take that part of you with you and you travel, it's just hard. It's just difficult. It's distracting. You hate it. You hate in some ways what you've become. You hate what you filled your mind with. You hate it. You don't like it. You know it's not working. Some of you don't get to put your kids to bed at night because of sex. Some of you, you know, you were so sexually active before you got married, and, and this is so common, so this will help you because you think you're the only one. And you remember your wife was so, before you got married, she was so sensual, and you just, oh, sex was great, great, great. Then you got married, and about three or four months into it, six months into it, it's like she just turned something off. And you're like, wait a minute, you're, you're, what, what happened? We're going to talk about that. It's not working. I'm just telling you. You know this, I just wish all of us could get in the back of a big arena, all the Americans and go, okay, let's just face up to this. Okay, it's sort of like the king has on no clothes kind of a thing, you know? Let's just not pretend anymore. Let's just face up to something. The way we're approaching sex, the way we market it, the way we use it to advertise, the way it's on you know, every music video and the way it's portrayed, come on, this isn't helping us. You're not better off. I'm not better off. We have bought a lie and we are paying the price. It doesn't make your life better. It makes your life more complicated. And the thing that's really the, the ripoff is that the decisions some of you have made and some of us have made in our 18, 19, 20 year old and those freshman college years and all that stuff that where it made our life worse wasn't in that stage of life. It made our life worth in, worse in the next stage of life. And if you're single and you're into the whole dating thing and you know, you know, all the stuff that goes with that in our culture and you've kind of bought into that, I just gotta let you know. If it feels like it's working now, heads up, a couple of relationships, another stage of life away, you'll discover that it didn't and wasn't and never did work. Your life will not be better. Your life will be more complicated. Now, if you were God and you saw what we see, I mean, all the way from child abuse to what's happening in Africa in terms of AIDS ripping to that continent and hundreds of thousands, millions of children growing up without parents because of sex, you know, mis misapplication of sex, and listen to this, if you were to go back and to pick the top news stories over the past two years, the top, the ones that you went to work and talked about, hey, did you hear about, did you hear about, even the ones that broke this weekend, 90% of them 
have a sexual component. 90% of the big breaking, I can't believe that happened, I can't believe she did that, can't believe that happened to them. There's a sexual component. It's like every single day on you know, cable news and on news on the radio, it's like, it's not working, it's not working, it's not working, broken, 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 broken. So if you were God and saw all that, what would you say about sex? Be careful, be safe, be responsible. Oh, if you were God and you saw all that and he would just be able to see into all of your souls and all of your heart and all the, the struggle with intimacy and the struggle in marriage and, you know, I wish I hadn't and the ghosts that follow you, some of you around into your marriage from the past and the addictions and you were abused as a child and now you're trying to do the intimacy thing as an adult and there's such a disconnect and your psychologist has sorted it all out for you. If you were God and you saw all that times, you know, to the hundredth or the thousandth power, all the people just in the United States, and then suddenly you could have everybody's attention and make one statement about sex. What do you think he would say if he loved you? He would say the opposite of what culture has told you and told me. Because culture, here's a news flash. Culture's just trying to make a buck. God loves you. Culture's just trying to make a dollar. God loves you. And so he says something radically different. It's an old fashioned message. But I don't even need to read anything out of the Bible to tell you that what we're doing now isn't working. Because we're all, 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 we all pay a price every single day. When, when I grew up, and this is really weird, this is so odd. I grew up and I was taught, don't laugh in front of me, you can laugh in the car going home. <laughs> I was taught that sex is for married people only. <laughs> How absurd is that? And I believed it. And I had all the same temptations and went through the 70s. And back then there wasn't, you know, all the sexually transmitted diseases. It was just sex, drugs, and rock and roll. It was just, you know, nobody cared, you know. I went through all that, you know, halter tops, woo, you know, the whole deal, like, <laughs> right? I mean, we saw everybody's belly button way back then. That was, this ain't anything new, right? Hip huggers, you remember all that stuff, right? And drugs, you know, the whole thing. And, and, and I just bought it. I just said, you know what? Sex is for married people. And, and then, you know, years later, I, I met a girl named Sandra Walker, and we started dating. And you can't even believe this. She grew up being taught the same thing. How absurd. Us poor people, we were so un, you know, out, out of sync with culture, believe that sex is just for married people. And, you know, we dated, and, you know, I was just, like, over the top attracted to her. And I, I can't speak for her, but, you know, I, may, I had a cool car, you know. I don't know. <laughs> And a condominium and vinings, you know, I had the package, you know, I don't know what's going on there. And, <laughs> and we decided that sex was just for married people. And I got to tell you, this is just one man's story, so discounted as that. If I could go back and live my life over again, I wouldn't change any of that. I mean, there's a whole bunch of spring breaks I didn't get to go on. There's a whole bunch of parties I didn't get to go to. And there's a whole bunch of girls that you just kind of went the other way. And I got to tell you, I look back and I don't go, God, I missed out. But I talk to people as a profession who wish they could go back and miss out on some things. You know why? Forget the Bible for a second. It doesn't work. It doesn't lead anywhere good. Nobody looks back and said, gosh, if I just slept with more people. You know, if I just had more sex, if I had a different kind of sex, if I had experimented more, I, I, you know, the reason I'm struggling today is a lack. Of, no one's ever heard that story. You know why? Because that is a lie. Now, why do I even have to say this? You know that. We all know that. Just you know, everybody, if you get them honest and rip back all the layers and, you know, get them sober enough to talk straight and get them out of their environment where they're trying to be something they're not, we know that. So what's wrong? Why can something be so, that's so obvious be so severely missed? And why is it if I were to stand out in the middle of, you know, whatever town you live in with a big sign that says, sex is for married people and preach it, people would <laughs> drive by and go... Good grief. What's that about? It's because it's so twisted. And we all are paying a price. And boy, our kids, they're really going to pay a price.
So every once in a while, I got to put on my prophet hat and come out here and say what's obvious. Sex is for married people, not adults, not ready for it people, not consenting adults. Sex is for married people. It's, it's like a fire. I mean, this is so elementary, but let, maybe you got to do this for a second. It's like a fire. You know, fire's good when it's in the fire pit. <laughs> fire's not good just raging through the forest, right? <laughs> the problem's not fire. The problem's the location. I, I, I love to camp. I take my kids camping. The very first thing we do is we build a fire. <clears throat> I have them collect the wood. I bring the matches. We build a fire. It's wonderful. They immediately want to put sticks in the fire, get the sticks on fire, and run through the woods because they have torches. I have a torch, and I'm going, okay, bring all the fire back to the fire pit. And they're going, Dad, but you built the fire. You brought the matches. I'm going, yeah, because fire is good right here. It's awesome right here. It wouldn't be the same camping without it right here. But you can't run through the woods, Tarzan, with a flaming stick <laughs> dropping sparks everywhere in the woods because then, listen, this very wonderful thing becomes, please don't miss this, this wonderful thing becomes extraordinarily destructive. Not just a little destructive, extraordinarily destructive. Now, before you kind of get all bent out of shape at me because I'm the preacher, and what would you expect the preacher to say? Just if you don't hear anything else, listen to this, okay? This is a starting point for you as you start rethinking about sex. God created it. He brought the matches he stacked the first pile of wood. He poured on a gallon of kerosene. And he said to all of the angels in creation, hey, you like sun, moon, and the stars? That's cool, but watch this. And they were like, whoa. We've seen lions and tigers and bears, oh my, but between two human beings, that's like a totally different thing. God's going, I made that up from nothing. Started with nothing and made sex. Look at that. Is that just like unbelievable? And the angels looked on going, God, wish I was human. <laughs> I don't know if they said that. <laughs> Probably. <clears throat> so I just want to read you three verses. Because why do we need to preach on this? Isn't this obvious? Isn't this like, don't forget to eat <laughs> and don't forget to breathe? Isn't it just that obvious? 1 Corinthians chapter 6, here's what Paul says. He planted a church, 1 Corinthians 6, chapter, uh, 1 Corinthians 6 we're gonna, I'm going to skip around a little bit, verse 18. He planted a church in a, in a culture where they just thought sex is an activity. That's the twist. See, that's, that's what we bought into it. Sex is activity. Go there and have a little sex. Go back, go back home. Go there and have a little sex. Go back home. Get in front of the computer. Have a little sex. Come back home. It's just an activity. It's just something to do. It's just a hobby. It's just, it's just, a, you know, it's just something you do. And Paul drops into a culture that believed that lie. In fact, in that culture, you could go to the temple and worship a pagan deity and have sex with a temple prostitute and pay for the prostitute, and that's part of the worship thing. And then you come home and you know, see the kids and have lunch and go to a soccer game. It's just, just, sex is just something you do, isn't it? And Paul drops into that culture and says, okay, okay, where do I start? Let me just start with this. Here's what he says. He says, Here, here's God's take on the whole thing. 1 Corinthians 6, 18. Flee, pretty strong word, from sexual immorality. Now, unfortunately, I have to define immorality for you. I know. Flee sexual immorality. That is, run away from it. That is, don't flirt with it. Don't get as close as you can. Don't, you know, entertain yourself with it. Flee sexual immorality. And, and, and here's why I have to, to define it. See, if you're here today or you're listening to this and you're um, living with a guy or living with a girl, you're not married, you're living together, you look at that verse and I know what you think. You think, that's right. We should flee sexual immorality. But um, this isn't immoral. Um, you're married and you have a girlfriend on the side or you're married and you have a boyfriend on the side and you really love both. You love your family. You don't want to wreck your family, but you love this guy. He makes you feel the way you used to feel. And you got a cool song and it reminds you, in fact, he was your boyfriend in high school and it's kind of working out. And in secret life, you have some guilt, but you see flee sexual immorality and you say, I understand, you go, I agree we should flee sexual immorality, but I don't think this is immoral. You got an internet habit. And you're going, yeah, I think we should all flee sexual immorality. I don't think this is immoral. I understand that because we live in a culture that we get to redefine the word. So real quick, let me tell you what the Bible says is immoral. And you don't have to agree with this. You may totally disagree. But please, as I talk about immorality, I have to define it the way the Bible defines it because we're reading from the Bible, okay? In the Bible, Old Testament and New, immorality is sexuality or sensuality outside the context of marriage, that sexual activity or, or intentional sensuality outside the context of marriage, that's what the Bible considers immorality. You're going, well, then 
then I am really messed up because I have a lot of that. Okay, granted, I'm just trying to define it as the Bible. And so here's what Paul says. He says, look, when it comes to sexual activity or sensuality outside the context of marriage, you got to run away from that. And then listen to this next phrase because this is the part, it's been in the Bible for 2,000 years. I don't know why it's not you know, on a billboard somewhere because every one of you has been impacted by this next insight, okay? Every single one of us has been impacted by this next insight. And it's been sitting here for a couple thousand years. All, this is the next phrase in the verse, all other sins, all other sins, hold it right there, listen, listen, all other sins, Paul's about to say, now look, 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 I know there's all kinds of sins, but when it comes to sexual sin, they are in a category all of their own. He, this is, think about how exclusive this is. All other sins, Paul, all other, yep, I'm about to make a comment about sexual sin because when it comes to sexual sin, it is in a category all of its own. Not because God gets so bent out of shape over it worse, more than others, but because of the way it impacts you. It's not that God you know, goes ballistic over sexual sin versus other sin. That's not what the point he's about to make. The reason sexual sin is in a category all of its own is not God's response, it's your response. It's not God's you know, reaction, it's the way you react. Because sexual sin takes a toll on a human being in a category that no other sin takes a toll. And anybody who's a psychologist or a counselor or who studied would say, you know what, I never thought of it that way, but you're exactly right. Because a seven-year-old, a seven-year-old, an eight-year-old can be sexually molested. And when she's 47, somehow she's still carrying it. And in her case, it wasn't even a sin. It was somebody else's sin. And she's still being impacted. Because sexual sin is different than any other sin. The consequences are different than any other sin. It is a fire that when it's taken out of its original context, it is extraordinarily destructive. But we already know that. Here's what he says as explanation. I'm jumping back now to verse 15. Do you not know, because they didn't and we don't, 1 Corinthians 6, 15. Do you not know that your bodies, your physical bodies, are members of Christ himself. And he's referring to this thing we've talked about before that when we come together with our physical bodies, we represent Christ on the earth. We're his hands, his feet, his eyes, his ears. We do his work. We represent him. We're compassionate. We give. We're generous. We, know we, we do the work of Christ on earth. He says, now your physical bodies as Christians are all part of that. Shall I th then take the members of Christ, and then this was the word that just caused them to go, what? And what's that next word? I want to hear you say it. Unite, unite, fasten, glue, permanently attached. That's what that word means. Shall I take members of Christ himself, then I shall I take the members of Christ and unite them with a prostitute? <laughs> and, and his audience is going, whoa, that's a little bit strong there. No, we're not uniting, we're just having sex. Who said anything about unite, glue, join together, fasten? That's like a permanent thing, Paul. You've misunderstood. Look, I, I, I gotta be honest, Paul. Last two weekends ago when I was down there at the, the, the temple thing, um, I don't even remember her name. I didn't unite. Paul is going, oh yeah, you did. Because you don't understand sex. You think it's physical. You think it's an activity. You think you can draw a circle around it and that's over and I just go on with my life. Paul's going, oh, you Christian in Corinth, you, you got a lot to learn. You don't understand sex. See, God made it. He understands it. And I'm telling you, when you have sex with somebody, you've united. With Paul, that sounds kind of permanent. Paul's going, yeah, let me go on and explain. Verse 16, do you not know, because they didn't, that he who unites himself with a prostitute is one with her in body? Oh, we're not one. We just had like a deal, you know? I mean, she probably doesn't know my name either. I mean, it was like a spring break. I was 18, you know. Okay, I was 24, and, you know, I met, and, you know, and everybody and the thing, and we spent the night, and I felt terrible about it, and I asked God to forgive me, and, you know, I... Oh, Paul goes, oh, you didn't, you didn't know, did you? You thought it was an activity. You thought it was an event. You thought it was a pastime. No, it's a pathway. You, see, when you have sex with someone, you unite with them. You fasten, you glue, you become one with them. And then when you separate, you take part of them and they take part of you. Because there's something permanent about it. And the reason you can laugh about some of your past, but you can't laugh about your sexual sin 
The reason you can kind of put a lot of your sin, even you were in jail once and you had this deal happen and you got, you know, even though you can kind of put a lot of your sin behind you and it just, you sort of put a circle around it and it just goes on, you don't do that with sexual sin, do you? See, when you're with your husband or your wife and then there's these ghosts, what is that? I thought I dealt with that. And then you're trying to be honest with your kids, and there's all this, this, you're not sure how to talk about it. And you're getting married, and you weren't sure you're going to tell the whole thing, but who cares? Because it's just the past, it's just the circle. But now that I've met the person I want to spend the rest of my life with, why does what seem like just an event, a weekend, a person, a thing, why is it so big now? Why does it follow me? Paul's going, oh, nobody told you. Sex isn't physical. Sex is a soul thing, it's a heart thing. Sex was God's way to physically illustrate and to create a sense of intimacy. And you know what you've done, and, and, and this is so condemning for many of us, and it's bad news for many of us, but again, I'm gonna just, you know, once a year go, here it is, you do what you want to with it. Sex is about intimacy, and when you take sex out of the context God designed it for, you foul up your intimacy factor. You foul up your ability to be intimate. You tweak and deal and redial and undial what God designed to allow you to be intimate and create, not just intimate physically, but this amazing thing he created called intimacy. <clears throat> you mess with it. That's why, again, even if you were raped, even if you were abused as a child, it had nothing to do with you. It was somebody else's sin. You still struggle in the realm of intimacy because sexuality is about intimacy. It is not an isolated event. And Paul then goes all the way back to the book of Genesis to illustrate it because this is amazing. By, the, by Genesis chapter two, you know, Genesis is the first book of the Bible. By chapter two, God has already told us what sex is. He knew we were gonna cover this like really quick, okay? Because this is like a big deal forever and ever, ever. And so Paul refers back to Genesis two to try to help these Corinthian Christians realize, okay, you think you're just kind of running down there and having a deal, but this, this is gonna impact you for, for your life till you get this straight. He said, don't you know that he who unites himself with a prostitute is one with her in body? For it is said, and he quotes the book of Genesis, the two, talking about when God created Adam and Eve, the two will become one flesh. The two will become one flesh. That when two people unite in, in, in sexuality, there is a oneness. Now here's just the truth, and this explains some of your struggles. There is a oneness, and you can never, ever completely unone. What happened in the oneness of sex? You rip it apart, but you leave a little of you and you take a little of them. And it impacts your ability to express and experience intimacy. Have you ever in culture heard anyone talk about that? Never. Has it even been ever even been implied in a movie you've seen? Never. Is it ever implied as far as the outcome? I mean, you know, there's some huge movie and she has an affair and her husband catches her. <gasps> oh, that's nothing. That happens all the time. Let's fast forward, you know, go forward 20 years. All of a sudden she's, she's you know, we don't, nobody even talks about it. God's going, oh, this is fundamental. And you know what you know? You know this is true. You didn't have these terms. You wouldn't have thought of it in these ways. But you know, we know. We know. And because God designed it and God loves you, what else is he going to say except, look, flee immorality. Why? Because it's dangerous. Because I might get sick. No. Because I might get pregnant. No. I mean, we'll deal with all that. Because it's going to dent your soul. It's going to mess with your ability to experience what I want you to experience. This is a big deal. And the reason... It's throughout the Old and New Testaments because God's not against sex. Remember, he brought the matches. He built the fire. He threw the first one on and, you know, he's for it. But he's for you. And then listen to how it concludes. Going back to the verse we ended with, verse 18. Flee from sexual immorality. All other sins a man commits are outside his body. But he who, here's this phrase, maybe this is new for you, sins sexually. He who sins sexually, he who sins sexually, sins against his own body. God's saying, listen, 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 listen. You're going to hurt yourself. You're hurting yourself. 
you're choosing to do something and you hurt yourself. I didn't hurt myself. I got out of there scot-free, changed my numbers. You'd never be able to get in touch with me. Nobody's sick, nobody's died, nobody's pregnant. I'm fine, I'm free, I'm clear. God's going, oh, you don't understand sex. You just hurt yourself. So what do you do with that? You know, there's one group, I understand, there's one group that hears me and goes, what would you expect from the preacher? I'm out of here. That is so stupid. Rip Van Winkle. Wake up. Okay. You know, this is the 21st. I understand that. Here's what I would say to you. Just one word. Just one word for you. If you're kind of, you know, kind of dissing the whole thing and, you know, well, you know, okay, here's what I'd say. My word for you is just remember. Just remember this. Because here's what's going to happen. One day you're going to wake up at the bottom of the heap or one day you might wake up at the top of the heap and, or somewhere in the middle, obviously, but bottom or top. The bottom of the heap, your life is a mess and you're trying to figure out why and why have things not worked out? Why are you so empty and why do things not work out? Maybe you'll remember this message. Maybe you'll wake up at the top. You have more money and more women or more men or more whatever than you ever want. You got everything a person could want and you look in the mirror and your gut is empty. You are numb. You cannot seem to connect and stay connected and squeeze out of the people around you the, 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 the intimacy that you were designed to experience. And maybe you'll remember this. Maybe you'll find a friend. Maybe you'll find a church. Maybe you'll find a Bible. And you'll go, oh, that's right. It's not we're king. And you had enough money and you had enough influence to chase it a little bit longer than the average person. But at the end, it's not we're king. It doesn't work that's why in the old and new testament god who loves you said okay big time out it's about intimacy it's about a permanent relationship it's about oneness and you'll either figure it out the easy way or the hard way you'll trust me and obey or you'll disobey and then learn to trust me for for the majority of us though it's like okay i, I you don't have to convince me i kind of knew that i knew it intuitively put some words on some things i thought about before what do i do and, and your word it starts with r as well it's not remember it's a big old testament word it's repent repent you know what repent means repent means run away flee turn around go the opposite direction and do you know where i think you should begin repenting if you were just to ask me andy what do i do first you need to repent of your sexual sin. You need to repent of your sexual sin. You know it's followed you. You know that, I don't have to tell you that. You need to repent of it. It means you need to go and get alone and you need to go all the way back to those magazines in elementary school, whatever it was, to that thing out behind the house in the garage when, you know, whatever, how that worked in your neighborhood, you know, to that college freshman dorm thing, that spring break, I don't know to the relationships when you first moved to Atlanta and everybody and it seemed like it made sense and nobody seemed to care so you decided that whatever it is you need to repent repentance says I'm going to get on my knees and I'm going to get alone I'm going to repent of my sexual sin it means you get it all out on the table and you say God it wasn't just a pastime it was a pathway I don't like where it led I'm going to repent I'm going to think up I'm going to dream up I'm going to ask God to bring to my memory I want to just say God I I just repent I want to ask you to forgive me for all of it I'm just going to throw it all back up and say God please 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 I confess I sinned I didn't just make a mistake I didn't just you know kids will be kids I sinned and I don't want to carry any more of this into my future than I have to you repent Repentance means you make some big lifestyle changes. You get rid of your internet at home. <gasps> How could I live? Well, you get by, you know, it's amazing. You get more done probably. You just gotta decide how much of a repentance you wanna repent. It means you quit traveling with certain people. You quit going certain places. You stay home on the weekend. Every time I give this message to singles, I say this, so I'll say it for those of you who are single. For many of you, it means going onto your calendar and putting an X one year from today and decided I do not date. I do not date for a year. I'm going to give myself a year out of that scene to where God can do something on the inside of me and prepare me for whatever he has in the future. I'm not going to date for a year. Whenever I say that to singles groups, you know, the singles, it's like, <gasps> and then I think, you know, half of you aren't dating anyway. No big loss. It's like, <laughs> well, yeah, but just in case. I'm going, come on, I'm not being critical. Take a year off. Just totally coincidentally, this week I got a letter. Because every time I, I, I challenge that, I get letters a year later. Every time. Girl wrote me a letter. Lady, just wonderful letter. Andy, 
a year ago at 722, you did this and challenged us. And I, I, I said, okay, I'll do it. Took a year off. Greatest year. I'm so different. What God's done went on. She described what God's done in her heart. Repent means you, make, you take some drastic measures. Do you know why they need to be drastic? Because this is dangerous. You ever been to a zoo where all the animals were just out roaming around? No. Why? It's dangerous. You put animals behind bars. I don't want to go in that zoo. Lions and tigers, and they're eating each other. Why don't we have We don't want it's free. Let them roam around. No, I'm not going to go there. Hey, this is way more dangerous than that. That'll kill you. This will kill several generations of you. This will reach into your family. This will reach into your marriage and reach into your kids and how you parent and how you relate to your husband. This is way more dangerous than that. So you have to take drastic measures. And yeah, you'll look kind of goofy. And yeah, it's kind of silly. People think you're stupid. So what? One day when you have a marriage and a relationship that's permanent and that honors God, they'll just want to know what your secret is. And you can say, well, you got to be goofy. You got to do stupid things. You got to be extreme. You got to be, you know, anti-cultural in some ways. That's how you get here. Because I'm telling you, and you know this. Come on, come on, come on. If you just go with the flow of culture, it doesn't work. No one has a happy landing. No one lives happily ever after. You're just frustrated and you're just guilty. And you keep searching, 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 looking, looking, looking. It's her fault, and then it's his fault, and it's her fault, then it's his fault. Then it's her. Some of you are married. Can I tell you what you need to do? You need to repent together. Because before you were married, you slept together. And sex was great. And then three or four months, six months after you got married, it just stinks. And you think it's his fault and she thinks it's yours? No, you broke your intimacy. You tweaked it. You dialed it off the chart. You did something wrong. You're paying for it. It's not his fault. It's not her fault. It's your fault. You need to get on your knees and say, God, we sinned. We sinned. We just thought we were going to get married anyway and everybody. But God, I realized today, we sin. We repent of our sexual immorality. Save our marriage. Give us the ability to be intimate with each other. Not just have sex. Intimate. Give us the ability to be intimate with you. You know, it's interesting while I'm saying this. Isn't it true? In your heart, you're going, it's true. I don't like the implications, but it's true. Hey, if God loves you, what else would he say to you? Final verse, and we're done. Here's how the, say, knock over the table. Couldn't do that in the old days. <clears throat> Big old wooden pulpit be on the floor, dead. Oh, backed into the pulpit. <clears throat> Verse 20, listen to this, we're done. This is how he ends the passage. You were bought at a price. Bottom line, therefore, honor God with your body. Honor God with your body. It means getting up every morning. This is part of my prayer routine. God, surrender my hands, surrender my eyes, surrender my ears, surrender my mouth, surrender my feet. I want you to use this dying, decaying body to honor you somehow. I want to go where you want me to go. I want to say what you want me to say. I don't want to hear what you don't want me to hear. I don't want to look at what you don't want me to look at. I want to honor you with my body. And whatever price I pay and whatever I miss out on by honoring you with my body, I believe is worth it in the long run because I won't fall for the lie of our culture. Would you just do that? Would you be willing to do that? Would you just repent from your sexual immorality and flee? You know you won't regret it. And in time, because God is this way, he'll begin to heal you. I've seen it so many times. And God will enable you to experience intimacy which is way better than just sex. And God will prepare you for a better future. But it begins with repentance and a commitment to flee sexual immorality, to honor God with your body. Sex isn't just physical. It's way, way deeper than that because God designed it to be deeper than that. Why don't we stand together, please? Heavenly Father, thank you for the reminder uh, that we need to honor you with our body, with our mind, with our heart, with our inner being. Uh, Father, thank you for reminding us of how amazing your creation is and the creation that we find in one another. Uh, but also, Father, we pray for those that are still struggling with events that happened in their past. 
Father, thank you for your grace. Thank you for your mercy. And help us this week to honor you with our bodies. I pray for those in this room. All of us need to repent of something, but in particular, this area of life. Father, I pray that you would bring to mind and bring to heart the things that need to be said to you. And there may be some difficult apology conversations that need to take place as well. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please join us as we continue worshiping. Wandering into the night Wanting a place to hide This weary soul Is back home And I tried with all my might I just can't win the fight I'm slowly drifting A vagabond And just when I ran out of road I met a man I didn't know And he told me that I was not alone He picked me up But to believe my doubts are burning Like ashes in the wind So long to my old friend Burning and bitterness You can just keep moving No, you ain't welcome here From now till I walk the streets of gold I'll sing of how you saved my soul. This way with sun has found its way back. Oh, pick me up, turn me around, place my feet on solid ground. I thank the Master, I thank the Savior, because He healed my heart, He changed my name forever. I think the Savior, I thank God. He picked me up, turned me around, placed my feet on solid ground. I thank the Master, I thank the Savior, because He healed my heart, He changed my name, forever free, I'm not the same. I think the Savior, He picked me up, turned me around, placed my feet on solid ground. I think the Master, I think the Savior, because He healed my heart, He changed my name, forever free. I'm not the same. I think the Master, I think the Savior, I thank God. Have a great week and a great Thanksgiving.